Welcome to Church Hurts and the good, the bad, and the ugly about church, religion, and spirituality with a dash of recovery thrown in. If you've ever had questions about the church, maybe a bit jaded in your attitude toward religion, well, you come to the right place. Our host, he was an honors philosophy student, ordained a Presbyterian minister, planted three churches, taught at a prestigious university, but now, now he's just an aging curmudgeon who never quits asking the question why. The host of Church Hurts and Dr. John Bash. Are you tired? How about stressed? Do you find anxiety in your stomach these days, which is frustrating to diagnose and almost impossible to remove? Are you reaching for the Tums container more than usual? Now, I didn't need the poll taken last week by the APA, the American Psychiatric Institution Association, to know this, but it sure didn't surprise me to find out that 72% of people are anxious about the presidential election. That's just eight percentage points less than the results for the virus called Corona. Politics, political correctness, I already need a Tums with a few Advil to follow. There's one thing I know for sure. My view of politics is better than yours and how high my need is to make that point abundantly clear is at the very least a combination of two things, my personality and my dysfunction. Let me put it another way. My dysfunction and my personality will determine how badly I need to prove you wrong. But this is church hurts and what does all of this political stuff have to do with church? Don't we live in America where we have a separation of church and state? Today, we're going to look at that from a different angle. Church done right is about real life, a real God, and real people. And real people are stressed, and it's snuck into our families and our friendships and our sensitive little constitutions. So today, we're going to try to get practical. Political correctness can get rhetorical and theoretical very quickly, not to mention petty, but Thanksgiving is coming up. Family isn't theoretical. Friendships are needed and they aren't theoretical. Coworkers are real, and some of them have really bad political views. What do you do? How do you handle this better? Today, we have a guest this who's a man who's annoyingly patient, and I mean to the extreme. He's a great preacher, sometimes a sensitive pastor, and a very bad joke teller. Soon, he'll retire from being the senior pastor at Faith Bible Church in Glendale, Arizona, Welcome to Church Hurts and the Reverend Dr. Daniel Robert Lynn. Well, hi, John. Dan, start by telling us an annoying story of how politics can cause tension in the church. Well, just like uh, politics causes tension in our families, among our friendships, obviously the church is one of those communities that is hopefully pretty diverse. I mean, uh, although we are segregated in many ways, we're not always surrounded by people who think like us, whether it's generationally, racially, uh, or, or in, a, in a number of other ways. We've certainly experienced the way church hurts in the last election as we saw younger people gravitating toward a more liberal agenda, older people gravitating toward a more conservative agenda, uh, hurtful words cast in the midst of protests that were happening here in Phoenix and real division uh, in the church. A lot of people got hurt uh, and it was painful as a senior pastor to watch this unfold and, and not know exactly how to respond uh, except to kind of say, can't we all get along? And the answer was a resounding no, no, we can't. And so uh, I, yeah, church hurts. And one of the ways in which it hurts and is hurting right now is over the political divisions that we have in our country for sure. You know, you brought up um, our title, Church Hurts And. Um, was there a time, you know, you're, you're like an old curmudgeon like me now. And, and, you know, we're talking about you retiring as senior pastor of this thriving church. 
do you really qualify? I mean, was there a time in your life that kind of you had had enough church was too painful for you? Sure. Sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, right out of seminary, uh, back in the, in the early eighties, there was a lot of turmoil within the, uh, the denomination I was part of at the time I was serving in a church that went through, uh, a lot of upheaval with the denomination ended up withdrawing actually from the denomination. And I kind of got caught in the crossfires of all of that. Um, and, and it turned out that, um, a lot of people that were caught in that ended up in another denomination. And frankly, I think a lot of them were deeply hurt, deeply wounded, but um, didn't want to recognize that, you know, just wanted to hang on to the, we were right. Meanwhile, there were a whole lot of emotions underneath the surface of that. And, and frankly, uh, there was a lot of uh, smugness, arrogance, um, that, that was there, but it was really not because those people were smug or arrogant, but because they were just so deeply wounded. And, uh, and I was certainly among those, so much so that I actually ended up leaving ministry uh, for a good period of time. Uh, I was hurt so deeply, and I, I just really felt like if this is the way uh, God's people treated each other. I didn't really want to be part of that. And uh, maybe some of, you know, your listeners can identify, you know, it, I didn't even want to have anything to do with God for, for a while because of that. You yeah. know, the smugness and the arrogance, you're not talking about one side or the other, are you? Oh, no, 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 no. I mean, you know, pride comes before the fall and it was on both sides of the aisle. Absolutely. Um, you know, that's one of the things about us, right? And you, you alluded to it in your intro. We have a, a deep need to prove ourselves right and uh, very difficult for us to listen to people who have another perspective um, or to find unity in the midst of diversity when that's exactly, you know, was the hope of our founders uh, and certainly the hope of the New Testament scriptures that somehow in the midst of all this diversity, we would find something greater uh, to draw us together and create that unity. But that's really, really hard, I think, for all of us, because, uh, you know, we're not perfect. We're, ju we're just not. And our imperfection just is so evident uh, in these conversations. You know, last week on the show, we had a Roman Catholic priest, and I don't know if it was on the show or the after show, but um, he was talking about the regret of the Reformation from his perspective of literally having millions of denominations. And he was, he was kind of um, elevating the joy of the unity of the one church concept with Rome. And yet, you know, had to look at him and say, you know, at the same time, look how many people have left. And then I look, you're talking about denominations, but I come out here in Southern California to a mega church. And it had already gone through some splits. And in a sense, there was some growth there. And then there were mergers and there was some loss there. I mean, there were people just lost to the church, period. And it actually, because to them, it just seemed political, didn't it? Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. Yep. All right. But let's get back to politics as if we weren't just talking about it. Um, you know, the adage, never talk about politics or religion. Um, but I bet you find it's pretty hard to enforce that when people have some strong feelings you know how do you avoid the the controversy what's the best advice you can give for relationships in that regard well i you know i think one of the the, the misconceptions um that that uh or perspectives i guess that's missing and, and that has been super helpful to me is to just acknowledge uh that from cover to cover the bible is a very political book um, it, it's extremely political. It's all about a king. And it's about, uh, you know, God creates this world that is beautiful. He delegates his authority to uh, the first humans. Um, you know, we won't get into the literal, you know, foundations of that story, whether you believe that or not. But the reality is that from the get-go, it's very political. And it's really about, will you accept uh, the rule of God. And of course, the answer was no, and there was rebellion, and, and it destroyed marriages, it destroyed families, it destroyed um, tribes, nations, and there's, then there's this story of the nation of Israel that goes through a number of different iterations of political structure, um, you know, tribal, and then judges, and then kings, and then you look at that story, and you realize, you know, in the history of all those kings, uh, there's there's really 
uh, nothing but case study after case study of failure after failure, you know, I mean, just, um, and, and then you have the, the story of, of Jesus coming on the scene and declaring a new kingdom, a kingdom that uh, would be modeled in a very different way than the way we model kingdoms. And of course, all of that's happening in the context of the Roman Empire, as you know, and so um, I, I think it, it, it's very important that we say pretty emphatically for those at least who are in the Christian stream, uh, to be able to say that that unequivocally, the message of the Bible is that there is yet another king. And that king, unlike the kings of this world, is good. This king comes, he suffers, he dies, he's resurrected, all of that. And so we shouldn't enter the political discussion um, with no sense of certainty. Well, there, there's a sense in which we do have at least a picture of what the end result of politics is supposed to look like, and that is the flourishing of all people. And, uh, and we kind of start at that point, and then certainly there are divisions that grow from there. But I think one of my jobs as a pastor is to keep pulling people back to this notion that whatever your allegiance uh, may be in 21st century America, there is a greater allegiance uh, to be found in Christ. So. Uh, I, I think that's one of the ways you do it. Kind of the opposite view. You know, you probably are familiar with G.K. Chesterton, who said, um, I never discuss anything except politics and religion. Yeah. There's nothing else to discuss. And there's some truth there, isn't it? Because when we talk about what politics really is and what religion really is, that's kind of our life, right? Yeah, well, the very word, you know, politics is taken from the Greek word polis, which simply means city. And it really is a, it's really about relation. I mean, that, that word is just like, okay, how are we going to get along together? Uh, that's really what the word means. And you can't help but talk about how we're going to get along together. So a parent who's talking to their teenager about curfew is actually having a political discussion. How are we going to get along together? You know, I've got my rules, you've got your inclinations. How, how are we going to respond to that authority? All of that is political. And you're absolutely right. You cannot not talk about politics. You know, I, I know a number of people who have said, you know, I'm not really a fan of the political parties, the two party system. Mm -hmm. And I spent some time a few years ago in Romania where they had 16. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting to me that it still always came down to two. Mm -hmm. And I know you personally are not particularly a fan of Christians who buy wholesale into one political party or the other. Talk to me about that. Um, so I, I, I I guess I would start with this. Uh, I, I would start by saying that national politics are far less important than we think they are. Um, so uh, when, you, when you begin to realize that our founders in their wisdom created this beautiful system uh, where we have an executive branch, let us, legislative branch, and the legal branch of government, um, that in that separation of power uh, alone, there is a multiplicity not only of personalities and platforms and perspectives, but there's also a multiplicity of function. And while it's very, very popular, for example, to, for presidents to take credit for what the stock market is doing or whatever, most of the forces that, that influence the markets are removed from, from politics. I'm not saying tax policy doesn't matter or any of that, but really uh, there's so many forces beyond whatever any executive or Congress does. But the, the issues that touch us most, frankly, in seeking the flourishing of people happen in our own communities. And, and I think that while there's, there's great emphasis on national politics, the reality is that what touches our lives more is local politics and, and statewide politics. For example, even all this discussion about the current election, all the laws about the election are state laws. So I, I just think that as you begin to evaluate, you know, so for most parents, the thing that matters most is what's going on in their kid's school. You know, Washington has very little to do with that. How well or how often do you invest the time to learn about the people who are running for your local school board? Uh, you know, the, the enforcement of justice, for example, is far more rests far more with local judges than it does with the Supreme Court. And yet we put all of our focus on things that don't really impact us all that much in our 
day-to-day -day life in our own city where, uh, and, and determine our own flourishing. So what I'm, when I say that I'm not a fan of parties, what I mean by that is not that I don't lean toward one platform or another, but it would be, I think, silly to think that I could check all the boxes down one column of a ballot and end up with the results that I want at every level of government. Um, so I, I just want to caution people to, to be careful and, and intelligent as they go to, to, to vote, uh, not just nationally, and not let that national decision uh, assume that just because you, know, you voted for, you know, let's say, the right coach, that you've got the right place kicker. You know? I, I was expecting you to go more in the direction, and part of it's because I've heard a sermon on this from you, and I, you know, not like I've listened to all your sermons, but Augustine addressed the issue, you know, in the fifth century, Augustine wrote on the city of God and the city of man, right. and how the fact that it's not an either or, that we are part of both, but that our main identity um, as people who are associated with the church is to be with God, with Christ. And, but then we have a secondary identity that we need to work out um, with men. And it seems to me in the sermon, I felt a bit of um, discontent in you or irritation in you at the fact that kind of people would have the political party hat and forget that their first allegiance was some, supposed to be somewhere else. Well, well cer certainly that's the case, but but even more so, you know, in the in Augustine's model, you basically have church and state, um, kind of a Venn diagram. You know, you've got these two circles, and there's overlap when it comes to certain issues. And you know, I'm I'm really uh, convinced that that yeah, it is a Venn diagram, but the kingdom of God is above uh, the kingdom of this world, and, and so as those who follow Christ. Um, you know, one of our main responsibilities is to, first of all, to see ourselves, um, you know, the, the New Testament teaches that we're going to judge the nations, right? So we should not uh, stand within a party, but really we stand above a party as God's children. And we stand um, as people who are called to speak truth to power, even when in many ways we're sympathetic to those in power, you know? So I, I think it's interesting when you look at the people who we would judge to be politically successful in the Bible. Who were they? You know, Joseph was politically successful. Daniel was politically successful. Esther was politically successful and, and others. But in every case, it's not because they were embedded in a culture that was sympathetic to them. They were actually in hostile cu cultures, but they chose to live in such a way that they actually became so influential that they transformed the culture. And I think there are many of us who have this view that really um, we, we're in a post-Christian, post, uh, you know, yeah, post-Christian age now, in, in many ways, we are living in Babylon, and our role right now is to live out the Christian life and then speak truth to power when we have those opportunities. Okay, let me push you on that. You sound so balanced. I introduce you as a patient man, and you are, and yet I know your church well enough to know that there are political issues that you don't play the middle ground on. There are things that the things that people would identify as political issues, and I think you would end up saying no. Fundamentally, they're not. They're not even political issues when it comes to abortion, for example. Your church is not neutral. How do you navigate that in the political arena? Because there's a party affiliation there. Well, I think one thing, and I'm going to be patient again, uh, is to is to carefully listen to both sides. So the reality on that particular issue, let's just take the issue of, of abortion uh, and the kind of conservative insistence that we be on this track where the, the repeal of Roe v. Wade is kind of the agenda. And, it, you know, in that um, issue, it's important to point out that, you know, since Roe v. Wade, we've actually seen the decline of abortions uh, every year since the passing of Roe v. Wade. And we actually had the largest decrease in abortions during the Obama presidency, which is a like, that's startling, right? Um, we've uh, had 11 
conservative appointed Supreme Court justices and only four uh, Democratic uh, justices. And, uh, and yet we still have yet to repeal Roe v. Wade. And even if we did, all we would do would go back to the hodgepodge of state laws we had prior to Roe v. Wade. Now, I'm gonna say right away, please don't uh, misunderstand me. I'm very pro-life. I'm very much concerned that we have um, some sort of understanding of the limits of Roe v. Wade, if not the repeal of it, but we have to ask the question, okay, so what have been the most effective ways of reducing abortion? And the reality is that they've been things like access to contraceptives, access to uh, you know, prenatal care for, for women, um, a rise in economic status. I mean, lots of different things. And so I think this is an example of where generations or parties are, are talking past each other. I think it's quite possible for people to say, that we are, are genuinely for the unborn child and, and adamant about that and yet have very different strategies toward working toward that. I think if we could just get the big picture, it's like any negotiation, right? Um, it, it's, it's finding that common point and, and, and realizing that our policy differences are, are far, uh, I'm not saying they're not important, please don't misunderstand me, but, but there is a greater uh, a, a greater thing that we're both working toward. Isn't it hard on even yeah. that issue? And I can Absolutely. just see our, our listeners, you know, some are saying they hear where you're saying, know where you're coming from and get they're like, but that's the point. These pro-life people don't miss that. That is not the issue. The issue is that I'm a woman and I have the right over my own body. So we don't even, you know, the difficulty is the one position feels like you're not respecting me. You're right. not giving me rights. And the other position is, well, you're not respecting the baby and defending, right. you know, it goes on and on and on. Right. I had a friend, I sent out a quote a couple of weeks ago from C.S. Lewis um, in the screw tape letters, which I know you love and I love where we got these demons talking to each other. And this one says, my dear Wormwood, be sure that the patient remains completely fixated on politics arguments, political gossip, and obsessing on the faults of people they've never met serves as an excellent distraction. And it, it goes on from there. Just kind of. But then when I sent it out, a friend of mine said, you know what? He said, it's very relevant. Unhappily, if used now, it would have the most deleterious result. In other words, it's just not the time and place. When the Mongols are banging on the gate, it's the perfect time to focus on politics. You know, I get both sides of that. Do you? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, there's, um, and, and I think, uh, to be honest, I think social media is driving a lot of this, right? I mean, I just think there's this urgency to impose uh, our views on one another. Um, you know, there's truths and half truths floating around all over the place. Um, and, and we've always had disagreement in, in the United States over politics. I think uh, the thing that's different this time uh, is, is the rapidity at which we're receiving all this political messaging uh, is almost too much for our, our minds to absorb. So I really encourage people to be much more, uh, to focus more on reading than on listening to or watching. Uh, to dig into sources that may be unfamiliar or maybe even different than those sources that they would typically look at, uh, to try and get some balance in their thinking, not to give up their convictions, um, but, but just to kind of slow down, take a breath and, uh, and realize, I mean, we're going to get through this election. We are, you know, we're going to get through it. Hey, let's go to silly. You were a politician one time. What'd you learn? Uh, you know, that it pays to have a good campaign manager. Uh, don't tell me, <laughs> give me two sentences on what it was. <laughs> so, uh, John was, uh, Dr. Bash here was my, uh, campaign manager when I read, uh, ran for office in junior high school. So we've known each other for a long, long time. It was a great campaign. A great and campaign. It was. And the lesson though, if you recall, was don't be among you know, four men when there's one woman running against you That's right? Right. <laughs> in That's junior right. high school, not That's a good right. strategy. That's it. Um, you know, um, this week I heard that one of my great friends and supporters in ministry had a tumor near his brain and he's in the hospital right now and tests are being done. And 
something like that can serve as smelling salts to this other stuff that gets us wound up. I remember early in your marital life, something like that happened that just changed the thing. Are you willing to tell us about that? Yeah, sure. I mean, we, um, we had a son who was born with some um, pretty serious heart defects. And uh, when he was 20 months old, had a major heart surgery uh, that actually didn't go very well. Um, he was in ICU for months. Uh, it was a very uh, terrifying time in our lives. I had actually, um, I mentioned earlier that I spent some time away from ministry and I was at that time, the owner of a small business here in Arizona, uh, along with another fellow. And, um, you know, so I was trying to juggle my concerns about my son and my concerns about, um, my business. Uh, it was a very destructive time, I think, for our marriage as we both kind of lived in fear and, and didn't really have the tools uh, to talk about it. And, you know, I know you got some very concerning news yesterday, and, and I did too, as we learned about the passing of a, of a family member that was dear to all of us, and it was very surprising. And, yeah, I mean, I think I think in the midst of all this political stuff, there there is just um, a, a great encouragement, I know, on your part and, and on my part for people to just gain some perspective, you know, that um, life is life is short, life is precious, um, and we can get ourselves all wound up about stuff. But in the end, uh, the things that really matter um, are the are the people that are closest to us. You know, um, I just want to tell the end of the story and and then wrap up. Um, but, you know, Ryan, you know, we were distant at that time. You kind of froze out a lot of the world because it was so scary. Right. And he's had how many heart surgeries since then? Oh, it's like a bunch. Yeah. You know, dozens, it seems. And now he's a student at Harvard Law. I mean, what an amazing thing. I mean, yeah. I just love your son. Mm -hmm. And yet the fear that we can bring to the table um, and that comes at us uh, can be overwhelming. And in the midst of this political season, when I get wound up and when I help others who are getting wound up, I remember people like Ryan. Um, I remember the stories that remind us about what really matters. Yeah. Um, just in closing, I want to say a few words. I I was in a meeting the other day listening to a very bright woman open up about her struggles in life. Now I said very bright, but what I'm about to tell you may cause you to question that judgment. After admitting to general anxiety with life, she then listed patriarchy and global warming as examples of her personal anxiety causes. I'd be lying if I denied a very quick eye roll accompanied by an exasperated sigh. Seriously. Fortunately, my meeting was on Zoom and I was on mute, so my responses weren't obvious to those around me. But really, your life is so together that you have time to get wound up over global issues and trends of millenniums. Come on. As I reflected on my natural knee-jerk response, I was once again reminded of a favorite quote of mine. It's found on page 417 of the book entitled Alcoholics Anonymous. It's a paragraph many recovered alcoholics have committed to memory. Acceptance is the answer to all of my problems today. When I am disturbed, it is because I find some person, place, or thing, or situation, some fact of my life unacceptable to me. And I can find no serenity until I accept that person, place, thing, or situation as being exactly the way it's supposed to be at this moment. Nothing, absolutely nothing happens in God's world by mistake until I could accept my alcoholism and just make that a blank and figure out your issue there. I could not stay sober unless, unless I accept my life completely on life's terms, I cannot be happy. I need to concentrate not so much on what needs to be changed in the world as on what needs to be changed in me and in my attitudes. Wow, that, that's just good stuff. And then consider the words of the apostle in Col Colossians 3, 12 to 14. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, 
compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so also you must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. In other words, maybe instead of focusing on how crazy others' views are, I should focus on how I behave. Maybe others being so wrong should remind me to focus on my own flaws? Me? Wrong? Now, there's an idea that may just be from Jesus, and he loves me anyway and tells me to pass it on. And I know this today because our guest practiced it on me. He loved me when I didn't deserve it. I'm glad you've met my best friend, Dan, who likes to point to Jesus. And it's worth a thought. For Church or Dan, this is John Bash. Go and enjoy God today. Well, that was worth a thought for sure. And brings us to the end of this edition of Church Hurts and Next week, it's rumored we'll be walking on the edge of controversy, stirring the pot of denial, and finding movement of the divine. Our host, Dr. John Bash, is a shepherd with Standing Stone, a nonprofit ministry committed to caring for pastors and Christian leaders at risk of leaving the ministry prematurely. Come visit us at churchhurtsand.org. Tell us your story while you're there. Until then, remember, Church Hurts isn't the end of the story. Now go into the end. Enjoy God today, won't you?